So Friends of Mary Mini Bay, for those of you who don't know, um, we are a very unique organization here in that we take a holistic look at the environment. And so um, we have an active research program um, like that, all sorts of good stuff over the years from circulation study to using cage muscles for biomonitoring. Um, and we, we use our research to inform our advocacy. A lot of that revolving around uh, fish passage activities, turbine mortality. We've filed a number of Clean Water Act lawsuits, um, Endangered Species Act lawsuits. Um, we have a proposal in now to upgrade the Lower Androscoggin, uh, another proposal um, to do that uh, from C to B. Uh, we have an active education program. Uh, this is one component of it. A lot of the hands-on stuff, unfortunately, has been on hold because of our friend COVID. Um, I think, let's see, there's, there, there you can see the whole screen there. Um, and then we, um, we are a land trust as well. And uh, yeah, I don't see the conservation uh, uh, piece there. Let's see if it, it'll come up here. Anyone's, everyone see that or not? Can someone talk to me? Yes. Yes. Not for Emily. Okay. Thank you. There we go. So protected over 1500 acres by now. This is a little bit old slide here around the bay. Um, so this is the second to last uh, event in our speaker series. This year we had an abbreviated series, usually start in October and run through May. Started in January this year, easing our way into the Zoom universe. Um, as opposed to zooming our way. And so we have one more uh, event in May. These are the second Wednesdays in May. And, and I will, uh, and that's uh, Scott McFarlane, the river historian, and that will be, a, be an excellent presentation. Scott was, a, uh, was an undergraduate student at Bowdoin quite a while ago, and one of the few undergrads to get a, a paper published while he was uh, uh, working as an under, being a student as an undergrad. So, and that paper was about the history of the Androscoggin and the pollution on the Androscoggin. And uh, we are um, suing Central Maine Power right now um, over uh, lights on a couple of towers they erected here not long ago and the needless use of radar to microwave everybody. They're using the radar to um, now let them know when airplanes are a certain distance from the tower so they can control the lights that way. But we're suing them under nuisance law and, and Scott's paper gets into that. And I thank Scott for kind of reminding me of that. Uh, and it's a, it's a good old law and uh, not used as much anymore. So we'll see where it goes. I mentioned we're recording these. Uh, if you go to our homepage on the right side of the page and scroll down under education and you can see the speaker zone here and that's where you can uh, find a list of the different years and, and look at the recordings. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, introduce our speakers and then turn this over to them. Um, first, I'll introduce Emily, uh, Emily Bastian. She's the national, uh, the Native Fish, Co Native Fish Coalition National Vice Chair, um, founding member of the Native Fish Coalition and has served in various capacities for the national organization and the main chapter. Emily, Emily works in the hunting and fishing department at L.L. Bean. She's the first woman to hold the position of a department lead there. She's a registered Maine guide and she's fly fished since she was eight years old. That's probably about when I learned or even younger. Um, she is, uh, she's got a, a degree in ecology or, or degree in ecologist. I'm not sure exactly what the degree is called or in, but she's worked as a uh, park ranger for National Park Service. She's worked as a Maine game warden, a municipal law enforcement officer, field biologist, and she works has worked in fly fishing retail. She also worked for Maine Audubon from 2011 to 16, where she was responsible for the Maine Brook Trout Survey Project, which identified previously unknown populations of wild brook trout in remote ponds and coastal streams. And she's run a, a lodge for the AMC before as general manager. Um, and she's managed fly fishing, um, retail as well, uh, taught fly fishing and, you know, for beans, archery as well. And uh, 
if you don't like what she has to say, tough luck because she's got a black belt in karate, so she can say whatever she wants. And also with us tonight is Bob Mallard. He's a founding member, also a founding member of uh, and former national vice chair and current executive director and main board member for the Native Fish Coalition. And Bob has fly fished for over 40 years, He's a former fly shop owner, registered main guide. He blogs, he writes, he's an author. He doesn't just write, um, you know, journal articles, but he's actually published a book too. Uh, he's a fly designer um, and an advocate for native fish. He publishes uh, the Northeast, or is, he is a publisher too. And he's the North, Northeast regional editor and regular contributor to Fly Fish America magazine, um, staff fly designer at Catch Fly Fishing, and all sorts of other fly kinds of roles from ambassador to pro, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he's, um, as I say, he, he's a writer and he's a good photographer. Uh, his writing and his photographs and flies have been featured in a whole uh, litany of um, publications, Outdoor Life, Fly Fishing, The Drake, et cetera, et cetera. And he's author of several books, 50 Best Places uh, Fly Fishing in the Northeast, uh, 25 Best Towns Fly Fishing for Trout, and his most recent Square Tail, The Definitive Guide to Brook Trout and Where to Find Them. And he's got a website, bobmallard.com. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Bob, and have at it. And thank you both for coming. I really appreciate it and uh, glad you're here. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start a presentation. We're going to just talk about NFC, who we are, um, how we got to where we are, why we formed and what we're trying to do. So I'm going to jump into a, a share screen. At some point, I'm going to turn this over to Emily. Uh, the three founding members are really myself, Emily, and Ted Williams, conservation writer. And uh, so I'm going to jump to share screen. Yes. Yes. All right. So uh, our our mission: protect, preserve, restore. Uh, we're a nonpartisan, all volunteer, grassroots, donor-funded 501c3. Uh, we were incorporated in Maine as Native Fish Coalition of Maine. We are now um, in multiple states. Um, our entire focus is conservation, preservation, and restoration of native fish. Our belief is that no lake, pond, river, stream is truly restored, healthy, clean until um, it has its full complement of native species intact. It's devoid of non-native species or hatchery raised fish. Of course, this is a lofty goal today. Um, and, uh, but you know, it's, uh, it is our goal and we'd rather shoot high and, and fail to get to where we need to in the cases where we can't rather than um, shoot low terminology that's really important. Wild, self-sustaining, born in nature. These terms are morphing. They're being used uh, in some cases almost deliberately to, to take focus off of important things or put uh, a positive twist on something not positive. But wild, uh, self-sustaining, born in nature. Uh, you could go as far as saying of naturally, you know, deposited eggs in the case of fish. Native means indigenous, historically present. At at NFC, we say to that given body of water, not the state, not the region, but to the specific body of water, we almost always use the terms together, wild native, an indigenous species born in nature. We're a conservation organization. We're not a sporting organization or a fishing club. Our focus is fish, not fishing. We are concerned solely with native fish. We don't get involved in native fish or stocking unless it's pre presenting problems to uh, native species. And there's something that can be done with about it biologically, socially, economically. Most of our members are avid anglers, uh, but our focus um, is not game fish only. We get involved with bait fish and forage fish and, and rough fish. Uh, we are primarily uh, focused on game fish, and that's due to the fact that they're usually the first fish in trouble. Uh, sportsmen are a big reason we have a lot of the problem fish problems we have today. And... Uh, of course, when your game fish are intact, uh, you usually have a relatively healthy ecosystem. 
We're looking to bridge the gap between anglers. All of us have histories with other orgs and agencies. I've been, I was part of Sam's Fishing Initiative Committee for years uh, back when George Smith had Sam, uh, founder of a TU chapter up here, a 30 year TU member, uh, part of another group called Duddean Angling Society. But there's you know, always been something missing. And that's what this group is trying to, to accomplish. Uh, bridging the gap uh, between anglers, fishing and sporting groups, fish conservation organizations, state and fishing game, uh, state and federal fishing game, water protection organizations, non-fish conservation, <clears throat> state and federal conservation agencies, academics. One of the problems we have is a lot of water protection organizations, their focus is on clean water, not necessarily what's in it. A lot of our traditional conservation organizations seem to fall short when it comes to fish. Uh, they're much better at um, land mammals and birds. We're looking, uh, one of our, our strategy, it's information, education, regulations, research, restoration, reclamation. Uh, we look at community, uh, <laughs> commercial harvest, recreational harvest, incidental mortality, and that's associated typically with, um, but not always, with recreation. Of course, dams have uh, incidental mortality issues. Stocking, huge problem that goes virtually unaddressed by the conservation community. Invasive species, um, in my opinion, in with the exception of Atlantic salmon and some other sea run fish, it's our biggest threat in Maine. Pollution, habitat degradation, Focusing on brook trout, headwater streams. Uh, if we continue to see these warming trends, uh, the only brook trout that'll be left will be in, in uh, high gradient, high elevation headwater streams. Pond dwelling brook trout, they exist for the most part nowhere but Maine. Uh, they've been lost through their entire range. Of course, sea run brook trout, uh, they had fallen off the uh, map for years and there's been a resurgence in interest. It has to do with dam removal. It has to do with the uh, suspension of state-sponsored brown trout stocking programs, et cetera. Arctic char, again, they're mass, uh, Maine only. We don't have Arctic char anywhere else in the contiguous United States anymore. Atlantic salmon, and we recently expanded into Alabama, which puts us into this um, red-eye bass game. And these are small stream resident bass that are up against the same threats as trout hybridization, um, stocking, et cetera. Uh, we bring a much needed and long overdue native only and multi-species focus to fish conservation, along with a willingness to address fish as well as the habitats they live in. Um, a lot of the conservation focus these days, it's habitat and not that it shouldn't be, but it's not the end all. And one of the things that I've said in writing several times is while figuring out that habitat was a huge uh, uh, part of the problem was one of our greatest successes, forgetting that taking care of fish, um, you know, is one of our greatest failures. We seem to have forgot that we can clean up everything, we can fix everything, and if we don't address the fish themselves or don't protect the fish themselves, we're never going to get to where we need to go. Uh, these are your little beautiful um, headwater stream brook trout. Most people outside of New England uh, Northern New England will never see a brook trout bigger than that anymore because they're gone from rivers, they're gone from lakes and ponds. Pond dwelling brook trout, you know, it's a bigger fish. It's uh, unique to the Adirondacks region in Maine and a handful of waters in New Hampshire. Sea run brook trout, Massachusetts, Maine, for the most part, is all that's left. Maine is sitting on 90% of the uh, sea run brook trout left in America, 90% of the pond dwelling, 90% of the river dwelling. And it's not that we have done anything that great. It's that we started with more than most people. We developed later, but we're making the same mistakes today that everybody else made in the past. Arctic char, beautiful fish, exists nowhere but Maine. Um, these are floods pond uh, research fish. These fish are trapped annually and they're tagged and checked everything from egg size. And it's a living laboratory. Uh, of course, Atlantic salmon, everybody's probably familiar. Uh, they're not just federally endangered, they're critically endangered. They're hanging by a thread. Rare stream resident bass for people who've never seen them, they're beautiful. Uh, these are, you know, 12 inches is a big fish. They live in water that's crystal clear. 
And if it was anywhere else, it would be trout water, but it's just a bit too warm for trout and too cold for smallmouth bass. It's often high gradient water and, you know, red tip, tip fins, uh, they're beautiful fish. Who we are, we have a executive director position, a national board, we have a national advisory council. These are academic scientists, et cetera, who help and influences who we tap on and as needed. We have administration and technology, state boards, and the state boards have local advisory councils. We now have uh, state boards in Alabama, Connecticut, Maine, Mass, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Vermont. We're hoping to add a couple of chapters a year till we figure out where this ends. Uh, we have these working groups that uh, bring together people from advisory councils and the different chapters to provide a focus on specific um, species or life history forms, life forms or life histories. We're a very diverse group, um, especially from an age standpoint. Uh, I do a lot of uh, speaking at TU chapters and, and I look around the room and at 60 years old, I'm one of the youngest people in the, in the room and that's not a good sign. And that's been a problem with fish advocacy is we're no longer reaching young people. And Native Fish Coalition has managed to reach young people as well as older people. And so that's uh, something that is, it implies that it's working. We also get an unusual amount of positive feedback daily through the through email, so it's being heard. Uh, we're made up of activists, scientists, authors, writers, bloggers, outfitters, on and on. So again, from a skills and a background standpoint, it's a very diverse group. Don't have time to read this, but these are all the businesses and orgs that people in our boards have been affiliated with or are affiliated with. These are some of the um, people we've worked with, partnered with on projects, fish and game departments, uh, all kinds of conservation organizations, industry and uh, landowners and, and sporting groups. So again, uh, it's a very diverse, uh, I, I've often said, you know, you don't find a lot of groups that are working with SAM as well as, you know, AMC. Those are groups that have a notably different missions in most cases, but everybody has to play. Everybody plays a role. And the more we work together, the stronger we are. One of our most uh, important roles we play, it's the branding of the term native fish. In the world of trout, um, trout conservation was, uh, was started uh, for wild fish. It wasn't started for native fish. It was, it was to protect non-native wild brown trout. And it's continued that way for 40 years where with a focus on wild versus native and it's more of an opposition to stocking than it is support for native. So, you know, generations have lost uh, an understanding of what is native, what isn't, why is it important? So we've made a point of just pounding that term out there through swag and, uh, and writing. And you know everything from hats to key fobs to decals to bumper stickers, and it's working. We sell hundreds of hats, uh, so we see our own decals around, and that's going to help everybody in this game. Um, T-shirts again. That's Emily. Website and social media. Uh, we've got a few uh, former IT guys, including myself, uh, that you know we've put together quite an extensive uh, website. Uh, Ted Williams runs our blog. Uh, he posts daily. Every, every chapter has their own page, scrolling page with a lot of information. And uh, we have campaigns, documents, presentations, just a ton of information. Everything we do is full disclosure. If we write a letter, we post it. These are some examples of how strong social media can be and how many people you can reach. Uh, this is uh, post of just Emily holding a giant brook trout. It's 13,000 uh, plus views. It was shared on 80 Facebook pages. This is a picture of a smallmouth bass that had been gutted by an angler and pulled two brook trout out of it in down East Maine. We hit over 35,000 views on that. Uh, we got 123 comments. It was shared on almost 100 other Facebook pages you know, 11,000 uh, views about Arctic char. Those are huge numbers, uh, especially for a small nonprofit. We uh, 
have had extremely good luck and, and a great acceptance from the media. Um, we are getting constant press. Um, they're sharing stuff of, that we write. They're supporting us in every way they can. And, you know, nothing is helping getting that message out uh, more than the support of the media. And as you can see, it's everywhere from, you know, Northwood Sporting Journal, the Bangor Daily to the Drake, which is a young centric uh, um, fly fishing magazine. Fly Fisherman is an older audience. It's a print magazine and everything in between. Um, we, uh, Ted Williams wrote a piece for Fly Fisherman Magazine when we first started um, at their request. They wanted to know, what are we doing? What, what is unique about what we do? You know, why does uh, fish conservation need another group? And it was a very positive piece. I write regularly for MidCurrent, everything from Atlantic Salmon uh, to data, you know, the fact that we do a lot of studying, we don't do a lot with the data we, we collect. You know, how did we get in trouble with non-native trout? Daily bag limits in Vermont, which this is Vermont, this is everyone else. You know, how different states refer to, you know, have a definition in their rule book of trout, or in this case, brook trout, includes brown trout and rainbow trout. So that's a, the most read blog in fly fishing. Uh, this got picked up. It was an older story that I had put in um, in. Uh, Midcurrent that popped up on Mountain Journal, which is a very popular Rocky Mountain nonprof conservation. Um, I don't have access to how many people read it, but with 500 likes, I'm going to guess this was, you know, in the 50,000 read range, based on on what that number would look like if I did have access. So when I extrapolate from our highest counts, these numbers are off the charts. Uh, these are more conservation articles. These are pushed out in American Fly Fishing. It's one of the biggest publications. And one of the reasons we're always out in the fly fishing world is the angler is a big part of the problem today. You know, they're the ones who are accepting or driving or enabling this, this horrific level of stocking that's happening. The state-sponsored introduction of non-native species, it's, it's going on every day. And if we can't reach anglers, you know, we're in trouble. Emily writing in, uh, in uh, Fly Fish America on this is a, a kind of a term we've used, making native fish cool again. Uh, some reason, uh, you know, people got really caught up in non-native rainbows and browns and we're trying to bring them back. Uh, browns are great if you live in Europe. Rainbows are great if you live west of the continental divide. Brook trout are great if you're east of the Mississippi. Uh, we've written for the Friend of Baxter um, publication. Uh, again, we wrote about fish, and that's not something that they cover often. And we wrote a specific native-centric piece. I do a monthly column in Northwood Sporting Journal. It's a conservation column. It'll go as long as, uh, as he uh, has a tolerance for it. Uh, this is a you know, a tough publication by conservation standings uh, standpoint, and, and yet it's been pretty darn receptive. Uh, we're hitting the BDN regularly. I've got kind of an open invite, quick as I can write it, up to a couple a month, they'll take it. And they're being very re well read. I've seen some of the numbers. Uh, we, we write op-eds every chance we get challenging, you know, positions that different uh, fish and game departments are taking. Uh, this one here was interesting, the hippo in New Hampshire. They did a piece on um, state symbols. The cover was a brown trout. And the article talked about how the brook trout was their state uh, fish. And again, this is extremely common where people have no idea what fish is what anymore. And, you know, these are just more articles. Push them everywhere we can get them. Talk about native fish. Podcasting, you know, we're always available to podcasts. We're getting, you know, bounced around the internet. Again, consistent message. We've got a new number of authors in our uh, boards, which really helps as well. It helps with name recognition, you know, quote credibility. You know, of course, Ted's the foremost conservation writer of our time. Uh, Dr. Lewis, he's a, a geneticist out of um, Alabama. Uh, Doug Thompson's the foremost hydrologist in the East. Uh, Topher Brown's an Atlantic salmon expert, and these are my books. This is coming out soon, but they help us reach, you know, a broader range that, than we would if we didn't have that. 
presentations and shows. We've got a series of informational presentations. We take them to rod and gun clubs. We go to common ground. We've had extremely good uh, um, attendance at fish presentations in common ground fair of all places. And, you know, we have brook trout, Arctic char, Atlantic salmon, Maine state heritage fish waters, and uh, specific um, programs in New Hampshire and Vermont. This is just a short list of where we've gone. Retail stores, TU chapters, colleges. This is, you know, we're at L.L. Bean, we're at L.L. Bean, we're at Patagonia in um, Freeport. We've been in Patagonia in Boston, Cambridge. These are the sportsman shows and fly fishing shows. We go to everyone we can and we're talking native fish the whole time we're there trying to bring people into the fold. Information education, we do uh, these uh, info cards and we hand them out at events that in this case, we're showing people in New Hampshire that your wild trout management program is in big trouble. It's flatlined for 14 years. They have no intention of adding any new waters. In fact, they're gonna crush the program the first chance they get. This one's challenging the position in Maine that um, Atlantic salmon are not endangered at the state level. They only exist in Maine. They're federally endangered. How can they not be listed as endangered in Maine? Uh, this is uh, you know, something we did. Uh, we were really uh, on top of Vermont with their highest in native range, 12 fish a day limit. That's, um, that you'd have to go back. It's a 60 year old reg. And in Maine, you'd probably have to go back 50 years to find anything that high. Recently, it seems to have cracked. It looks like they're going to drop it to eight fish, which is still too high. But it's proof that, you know, if you stay with it, pressure works. Uh, Maine, we were part of a group that helped drive uh, this, um, and this was pre-NFC actually, drove this significant change where the use of live minnows as bait in, in the state of Maine uh, was always uh, um, by, by rule. And... Uh, or, and so it was, or the prohibition was by exception. Well, we've now got a rule a, that zone wide that it's no live fish is bait by rule and live fish is bait by exception. So it's turned completely on its head. And this is significant enough that we designed and paid for this handout. And again, it goes out, it shows and stuff and tells people from out of state, there's a big change in Maine you have to be aware of. Uh, we, uh, and I'm going to let Emily take over here because I went one slide too far. That's all right. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Bob. So picking up on some main, more main specific projects, we worked with the Maine Department of Marine Resources. Um, the first thing we did with them was add a brook trout fact sheet to their species information webpage uh, because brook trout, when they occur in um, brackish or salt water as their sea run um, life history, then they are managed in part by DMR. Um, they didn't have a fact sheet for brook trout, so we helped them um, come up with one and contributed some of the information. Um, and now it's on the DMR website there on Do You Know Your Catch? There's a link for brook trout. We, another project with DMR, um, the picture on the left shows what they had at first, um, up until 2016, 2017 actually, um, their sport fishing regulations for sea run fish featured prominently this brown trout in the center of the picture, um, surrounded by all these other lovely native species. Um, we worked with them to replace that brown trout with a brook trout, so we're featuring all native fish species, um, and added some verbiage about um, bag limit and regulations for brook trout in coastal waters. We've developed a series of informational videos and we'll be continuing that this year in earnest. Um, all of the chapters will. Um, Maine worked on um, two videos up on Floods Pond, which is where one of only 12 of the native Arctic char populations are remaining in the state. Um, it's a rare place to study this rare species. Um, it's closed to fishing because it's a public water supply. So it's a really fascinating living laboratory for, the, for this fish. We have two videos about Arctic char up there. Um, we did a video in New Hampshire about their wild native brook trout in some of the headwater um, higher elevation streams. And those can all be found on our website and our YouTube channel, if you'd like to take a look. 
our first uh, big informational signage project was this project um, that we worked with the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine and the Department of Inland Fish and Wildlife to develop an informational sign on our rare native Arctic char. Um, Mainers also, we call them blueback trout or also known as sunapee trout. And as we mentioned before, they are the last native Arctic char that are landlocked in the contiguous United States. Um, the biggest threat to these fish is invasive fish, especially bait fish, and in the case of the char, smelt. Um, so these signs went up on the um, 12 remaining native char waters in the state. And another informational sign, this is our by far our largest project to date. We partnered again with IFNW and the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine um, to develop and post signs on all of the state heritage fish waters across the state. Um, there are approximately 585 of them. These are mostly remote, um, mostly small waters throughout the state, more concentrated in the northern half of the state. Um, and they're legally designated as um, no live fish as bait and they are not stocked. They're protected from stocking. And this is, um, these are regulations in place to uh, protect the wild native brook trout populations in those ponds. We've We've engaged hundreds of volunteers out in the field to post these signs, and to date we've posted more than 400 of these heritage signs throughout the state. Um, Atlantic Salmon, of course. Um, this was a partnership with some different organizations, DSF, that's Downey Salmon Federation, Atlantic Salmon Federation, and of course DMR um, worked with us to um, feature a sign that shows an adult Atlantic Salmon as well as a small um, and or par actually in that picture um, that is that were being posted in native salmon watersheds. So we started in down east Maine. Um, they're also posted on the Penobscot watershed as well. Um, and it's to alert anglers and the public, anyone who's out and about on these waters or in the in these um, areas, that this very rare, critically endangered fish uh, resides in these waters. And we always give a little background information and encourage people um, with that strong message at the end, just please help protect these native fish. Um, another sign focused on sea run brook trout or salters. Um, these are very, this is a, a brook trout that lives in coastal water, um, coastal streams that has access to the ocean and um, some of the fish use that saltwater environment at certain times of the year. Um, they're looking for thermal refuge in some cases and in some cases um, feeding opportunities, uh, but it's a really interesting life history strategy that lo a lot of people are not aware of. So we've gotten a lot of great feedback on these signs. And you can, can see this in this picture, um, a lot of those historic Atlantic salmon rivers are also um, home to sea run brook trout. Um, another version of the sea run brook trout sign was um, rolled out for southern and mid coast Maine. Um, amazingly, there's still some viable brook trout, sea run brook trout streams in the southern more populated part of the state. Um, so this was a partnership with DMR again and the sea run brook trout coalition. Um, so these signs have been approved and they're going to these particular ones will start being posted um, more in earnest this year, 2021, we were. Um, the, this slide shows some custom signs that we were able to develop um, for the BPL lands, Bureau of Parks and Lands, so state-owned property. Um, there's a lot of it in Maine and they are home to wild native fish, um, some char waters as well as some state heritage fish waters. So to date, we've posted these custom signs on about 25 waters. We did a sign, um, oh, Bob. <laughs> uh, this one is a tribal custom sign. We were very excited to work with the Passamaquoddy tribe to um, develop a custom state heritage fish sign for the waters on their lands. Um, we use their tribal colors and their seal. And this is me meeting with their chief, presenting one of the original signs and then with some of their biologists and um, wardens also with a sign. So those are being posted in the field now. And um, I think there were a dozen or so of those waters. Another tribal sign with the Penobscot Nation. Um, there I am with Chief Francis and their fisheries biologist presenting the original sign. 
And here's Bob posting one of the signs and with um, a tribal member that he actually um, met in, in the woods as he was out. I wasn't there, but it was a great story. He was out um, trying to find this very remote pond had never been there before and ran into this, um, this gentleman out there, moose, moose hunting or moose scouting, I guess. <laughs> so that was a, a very cool experience. He thought the signs were awesome. Um, this is not Maine, but this is one of our Pennsylvania chapters. They're a, they're a new, pretty new chapter. This is one of their first big projects. Um, they got a approval to post signs um, on Wild Brook Trout Water in um, a preserve area um, along Six Penny Creek. And this, oh, now we're back to Maine. Um, this is the Rangeley Guides and Sportsmen's Association, IFNW and Native Fish Coalition, um, who we partnered with them to post signs specific to the highly invasive and non-native smallmouth bass that are now found throughout the Rapid River system. Um, one of the, if not the premier wild native brook trout river in the country. Um, and the Guides Association was hugely helpful with posting those signs. This is a newer project where we worked with Maine BPL, um, Inland Fish and Wildlife and Sportsman's Alliance of Maine to develop these signs for those BPL lands um, in the new Cold Stream Forest track specifically that are not heritage waters, but are by general law prohibiting the use of live fish as bait. Um, so these are waters where the regulations changed when the general law changed. So this is informational for people um, to prevent the use and continued spread of invasive bait fish. This was our, is our newest project, one of our newest projects. Um, this is exciting because it took us outside of our chapter territory. We worked with Maryland in this particular instance, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Um, this sign is specific to wild native brook trout which now have a catch and release mandate um, through most of the state. So the sign is uh, helping anglers to identify what they're catching and, and telling them that they must release those brook trout. Um, we purchased 225 signs with the Department of Natural Resources and they're going up all over the state. So that's very exciting. Um, we also worked at another outside Native Fish Coalition chapter project was with Rhode Island. Um, we worked with Rhode Island TU, Rhode Island Fish and Wildlife, Department of Environmental Management. This is also the focus on the wild native brook trout of, in this case, specifically the Wood River, which is their premier wild native brook trout fishery in, in the state. Habitat work. Um, this, this is a series of pictures looking at rock, man-made rock dams um, that we have encountered in various states and they are erected over the course of the season or the summer um, and they block, they can block the flow of water um, or slow the flow of water, but most importantly they're blocking fish, fish passage and thereby also warming the water, causing siltation. Um, so we're getting volunteers in there to find these dams and remove them and breach them so that fish can pass again. So we have some before and after pictures. Um, and if you volunteer for that project and send us some photos of your work, um, you will be an official rock dam buster. <laughs> this is our one of our fun volunteer opportunities. We write letters and position statements and testify at public hearings constantly. Um, this is a sample of some letters we wrote to state agencies challenging specific regulation changes, law changes, um, management practices, and land proposals. Um, anything that has a potential to affect wild native fish in any way, we will take a stance and, um, and publicly um, write that letter or testify. And that's all on our website, everything we've ever produced. Um, this is Similar, to, we should have talked about this a little earlier. This was another project with DMR, um, but we worked with Downey Salmon Federation and Atlantic Salmon Federation, um, again, on their coastal um, regulations, saltwater regulations to impose a maximum length limit on brown trout, maximum length of 25 inches. 
Um, and the purpose of that is not to protect brown trout, it's to protect um, adult endangered Atlantic salmon from possible misidentification. Um, and this was really an important change and, and an oversight, we think, on their part. Um, it was agreed to quickly and went into effect in 2018. Bob started to talk a little bit about Vermont's highest in brook trout native range limit on brook trout, um, a whopping 12 fish in rivers and streams. Um, so we cut the numbers every way we could, um, stacking Vermont up against neighboring states, against uh, states throughout brook trout range, um, and showed why it's important to get Vermont back in line with, with other states within native range. Uh, let's see, this is, whoop, this was an initiative in Maine again with the Maine Sportsman Magazine. Um, they have this program that they called the One That Didn't Get Away Club. Um, you could catch a big fish in Maine if it was of a certain size. Um, and you originally, if you killed it and had a warden verify the species and the size, you'd get this patch. Um, so we approached them and um, addressed the obvious problem first, that they have a basically a bounty on Atlantic sea run salmon, 15 pounds, and you get your patch. It's been illegal to fish for Atlantic salmon for quite some time in Maine now, um, so that was taken off right away. Um, we also were able to get a compromise position on the blueback trout, so Arctic char. Um, instead of requiring that people um, kill that fish, they are encouraging photographic evidence um, for purposes of their patch club, um, and that supports catch and release. Um, and an important addition to this is that they've since um, uh, added a one that got away club. So as a result of this conversation or this project, they've now got a special one for folks who just present pictures. So it, it was helpful. Awesome. Yes. Um, Another example of a letter writing campaign for the Maine chapter, we opposed proposals to remove two waters from Maine State Heritage Fish List. Um, so that's every year there's a rulemaking process that IFW goes through and um, there's often, unfortunately, attempts to um, roll back the State Heritage Fish Law in, in essence by removing waters. Um, and we submitted letters and testified at a public hearing in opposition to those removals. And in both cases, we're happy to say those proposals were removed and the waters remained on the protected heritage list. Um, we're working in concert to add more waters to the state heritage fish list. So while we oppose removals, we're also working to add them. Um, one in particular that's pictured here was actually omitted um, due to some administrative issues that should have been included a long time ago. Uh, we found that and ended up getting it added to the list in last year. We're looking in New Hampshire at their wild trout management program, which is in big trouble. Um, while on paper, it's a great program. It protects um, waters with a certain level of biomass of, of trout um, and with very strict protective regulations. Um, there's only 16 waters statewide. Um, New Hampshire is a big state with a lot of wild native brook trout to only have 16 waters that are protected and they haven't added any in the last 13 years. There's also some huge geographic holes in places where we know there's lots of waters that qualify. Um, so we've write, written articles, we've done presentations, we've met with fish and game officials. Um, our goal ultimately is to expand the program, um, but we're fighting against an organization or an agency that would rather see the program go away. Um, looking at, this is a series of graphs that look, went back um, last to a year and a half ago, two years ago when the North Zone um, regulation change, general law change was being considered. Um, the consideration was to extend or to change the use of live fish as bait um, to a prohibition across the North Zone instead of an allowance by um, exemption. We did an analysis, a pretty extensive analysis, cut the numbers many different ways, looked at each region, um, and looked at the, the waters ultimately that the regions were proposing to exempt from the protected list. Um, and what we found very clearly was that there was one region in particular that had a much longer list of exemptions, um, so therefore was, was fighting that law much 
more um, emphatically. And what we ended up with as a result of this was 54 lakes and ponds and 30 rivers and streams that might not have been protected otherwise were removed from that exemption list. So now we have- we were, the, we were the only conservation nonprofit who stood and opposed this at the public hearing. Um, we had a bunch of no-shows and we had one that uh, stood and said they would accept what's put in front of them. We stood up and said, we're not gonna accept this. This is outrageous. And uh, you know, these are changes that if you let them through, you're, it would take decades to pick it back apart. So, you know, to get these lopped off right away was the right thing to do. Great. Um, we are now part of a coalition that tried to get federally endangered Atlantic salmon listed as endangered at the state level in Maine. Um, this is incongruous. The lack of a state listing um, doesn't make sense. The only remaining populations of wild Atlantic salmon in the United States are in Maine. They are listed as endangered at the federal level, um, yet the state does not recognize the fish as and does not list the fish as an endangered species. Um, so we formed a coalition with an impressive list of organizations and individuals um, and requested both of IFNW and DMR um, to add Atlantic salmon to the endangered species list. Um, IFNW passed the ball to DMR, said it's not our fish, it's a marine fish, so we can't do anything about it. Um, DMR also said no. So now uh, we are part of a coalition of conservation organizations and individuals that are trying to amend Maine law um, to require that we list every species that's in Maine that is found in Maine for any part of their life cycle um, and is listed as an endangered or threatened species at the federal level to be included on the state endangered or threatened species list. Um, this is LD883 and it will be coming up for hearing and public input any day. Um, it has been approved for hearing. Um, and this is an act to protect endangered species whose life cycles include Maine land or waters. And for roughly 20 years, that was the law. And it was amended um, quietly to change it. Mm -hmm. These are our organizations that are currently on board in support of LD883. So we thank our friends of Merry Meeting Bay. They were a very early partner. And hopefully the list will continue to grow. Research. Um, this is up at Floods Pond in Maine. That's that very rare Arctic char population. Um, NFC stepped up to support that research effort by just purchasing some new equipment, um, better for the, the scientists and also more fish friendly as well. We designed and implemented, designed and installed a um, pumping system that brings fresh water from the lake up into the lab um, so that those fish that are being, um, that are in the lab waiting to be processed or waiting to be measured and, and pit tagged um, can be in fresh water or oxygenated water from the lake as opposed to having to constantly change the tanks out. So that was a huge improvement thanks to some engineers in our group. Um, we replaced these holding tanks instead of black Tupperware that was um, uninsulated and flimsy. We um, were able to secure a suite of Yeti coolers and buckets for these fish. So the water stays much colder, um, prevents the fish from jumping out by having a lid on them. Um, ultimately much easier to work with and safer. Here's our before and after picture featuring what we had to work with before NFC stepped in and now um, showcasing some of those significant improvements to that laboratory for our rarest inland salmonid. Including that rubber mat because fish were slipping out of people's hands and we've got rare uh, Arctic char sliding across some bare cement. Um, so we've solved that as well. We even ex procured some um, higher tech and, and new equipment for them. Their pit tag readers, these handheld units, um, were actually, they appeared in the video that we made um, of the floods pond fish. And the uh, company that makes these units, Avid, um, out of California, contacted us and, and um, noticed we were using one that was duct taped together and, and offered to replace one, refurbish one, and gave us a great deal on, on another. And we're, um, we were able to gift 
couple of those units to the university study. And that's testimony to how important social media is. I mean, we posted this. I went to MidCurrent. Uh, an executive from the company, Sarda Midcurrent, contacted me and said he'd like to help. And uh... very cool. Um, this is something we're doing right now, partnering with Downey Salmon Federation, um, as well as the Sipiac Environmental Department, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, uh, recently Maine DMR, um, in regard to a study performed in Downey's Maine, looking at three different streams. The idea is to see if sea run brook trout and other um, diadromous species move between freshwater streams in a bay ecosystem where multiple streams um, empty into this one large bay, Cobbs Cove Bay. Um, this is a really unique place to look at, to study this question. So this is an ongoing, we're in our second year of data collection. Uh, we've helped with other population surveys as well. Um, of course, the Floods Pond, rare Arctic char, um, anadromous river herring down in Massachusetts, stream-dwelling brook trout in Maine, Mass, New Hampshire, and PA. These are pictures of NFC members and volunteers in the field. This is an interesting one down here. What this is, is they're installing our um, these white, we've got new ones just went in. These are white plates to uh, allow volunteers to count uh, migrating alewives. This is who we are right now, our seven current chapters. And we are hoping, we are actively expanding, hoping to add new chapters in the coming months and years. Probably next up, um, I'm gonna say, who, wherever we have the interest and the, the uh, critical mass of folks who wanna step up and give some time and energy to help protect wild native fish. Um, that's why we're in Alabama. That wasn't a contiguous expansion. We just had a group of people who are passionate about protecting their native species. Um, here's where you can learn more about us, our website. We also have, uh, we're also on Facebook. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email us. Uh, we answer every inquiry, inquiry we get. So um, I think we have a couple minutes maybe to answer a few questions today. Um, but thanks so much for having us. Hey, our pleasure. Thank you for, for being here. We really appreciate both of you doing this for us. That's a great presentation. Um, I have, I have a, a, a question. Um, early on, Bob mentioned that uh, pond dwelling brown, uh, brook trout are pretty much all gone. Is that a temperature climate change issue or overfishing issue or both? What's the deal? It was, mo it was you know, it's mostly due to stocking and invasive species, but okay. you you can always connect and f far too few people do. If we didn't have angler exploitation, we wouldn't have stocking. We wouldn't have calls for stocking. And I'll go out on a limb and say, if we hadn't compromised our brook trout fishing to the degree we did through angler exploitation by allowing too much harvest, I don't believe we'd be suffering the, uh, the invasive bass and stuff that we are today. I think anglers took it in their own hands and I'm not defending them because it's, it's a you know, act of environmental terrorism. But, you know, when fish and game departments didn't step up, didn't protect and started moving fish around, um, that's where the angler learned it. They learned it from state fish and game who started moving rainbows, browns, everything else, and then complains when people move uh, bass around. But, I, you know, I, I would trace it all. I mean, the, the easy answer is it's invasive fish. We are starting to see warming, but the problem we had was, um, in southern, uh, outside of Maine and, and high elevations in uh, New Hampshire, as well as you know parts of the Adirondacks, they were lost long before we had a climate issue. In fact, a lot of the Adirondacks were lost and the White Mountains in New Hampshire to, um, to acid pre precipitation. Yep. And, you know, that, and it, that brings up something interesting, which is that was doom and gloom for brook trout for a long period in my lifetime. And we got past it. It's no longer something people talk about because it's been for the most part addressed. And that is what I use when people tell me that climate change is, is irreversible. And I said, you know what? That's not necessarily true. We've reversed other things, the hole in the ozone, you know, the uh, acid rain problems. And, you know, but, you know, so, but what we are seeing now in Maine, clearly we are seeing longer summers. And the big question with pond dwelling fish and in Maine, a lot of our streams are pond fed. They're not um, spring fed like the White Mountain streams. And they're low gradient, low elevation. Uh, what we're seeing is that 
downtime that all, always existed is lengthening. So the big question is going to be, we know these brook trout historically survived a month of really marginal conditions, August. Uh, and can they survive two months of it? I'd say no. And if we continue down that direction, some of the most at-risk brook trout in America will be the pond, what's left of the pond brook trout. I, I fear for coastal brook trout as well, uh, if they're in an area that's not spring rich, you know, they're low elevation. Brook trout live at the lowest elevations of any trout in America, any salmonids in America. And uh, low elevation is not your friend when it comes to uh, water temps. You know, fortunately, Cape Cod down east has a lot of springs, but that's not the case elsewhere along the coast. But, you know, it's a clear and real threat. And, uh, you know, what happens is, you know, yet to be determined. We've got Vance for the next question, and then Kermit is lined up after Vance. Vance asked, what was the native fish or fishes spurring Alabama to join? Um, well, Alabama um, was focused early on on the native stream resident bass, uh, specifically their red eye bass, which is comprised of, I think they're up to seven different species um, of red eyes. And, but in addition to that, that's a, a game fish that a lot of uh, native game fish that a lot of Alabama anglers um, are, are passionate about, but Alabama also has a huge biodiversity of native fish species. Um, it is one of, it is the most aquatically diverse states um, in the country. So they call it the, some call it the Amazon of the United States. So we're excited to get involved. We're already starting to look at some projects um, with native darters, um, endangered minnow species down there. So there's a lot of potential in Alabama. Um, and the, the current chair was, has been involved with Native Fish Coalition as an advisory council member, as our warm water expert um, from the beginning. So he's been for a couple of years now um, getting folks excited about protecting native fish through NFC down there. And now we have a, a chapter. Kermit. Uh, the situation in Alabama with the bass, it's not that different than what trout face, interestingly, which is that the angling community and fish and game um, prefer the bigger fish, the, the largemouth bass, which is a um, um, huge moneymaker, smallmouth bass. So they've moved around a lot of these aggressive uh, bass species, which are now hybrid, uh, hybridizing with these uh, rare, unique stream uh, species, and they're hybridizing them right out of business. That's how the West, the Rocky Mountains, lost most of its cutthroat. Um, you know, the fabled Rocky Mountain um, trout streams that everybody writes about and talks about and people go from all over the country, most of them are non-native fisheries. And that's because we introduced rainbows which hybridized uh, the uh, cutthroat out of existence. And uh, that's how New Hampshire lost its, uh, its blueback or sunapee trout. It was hybridization with lake trout. Most people think it was exploitation or something else, it was hybridization. The resulting uh, uh, fish during the, the hybridization between lake trout, the introduced lake trout and the Arctic char, um, the result was a mule. It was a sterile mule. And the more uh, aggressive lake trout, which were doing the bulk of the spawning, over time, they were creating just leaving a trail of mules behind and nobody was spawning anymore but the lake trout. And now they're gone. They're not even hybridized out. They're gone. And uh, so, you know, that's the unique thing in Alabama. And what's interesting in Alabama is we don't have to undo, um, you know, 40 years of, of some questionable trout conservation. Uh, they don't have a group down there that's, you know, drifted off course and supporting brown trout and rainbows. So um, it's quite interesting. They have blind cave fish. They have fish that live in... Um, in at weed choked water that, you know, are so unique, they can't, they're down to like one or two, you know, spring holes somewhere in the state. It's fascinating. Great. Kermit, you're unmuted. You want to ask the next question and Joshua is up next. Well, I've heard, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. The, uh, catch it. Yes, I, I turned up. Um, catch and release in the, of salmon in the range of the region seems to be getting a lot of bad press. And I wondered what your take was on 
that situation with that fishery? Landlocked salmon are non-native. They're the most moved around uh, game fish in Maine. Uh, we, are, we are now at two, over 200 um, what they call principal fisheries for um, landlocked salmon, which means a high likelihood of you being able to catch one. We've got them, these, they're present in another 100. We started with a baseline of four landlocked salmon lakes in Maine. We're now up over 300, most of which were introduced by Fish and Game. So what we have now is we have an established naturalized population of non-native fish in Rangeley that are living at the expense of not only the brook trout, competition for food and space, but they're the primary reason why we don't have Arctic char in Rangeley anymore. Uh, the introduction of landlocked salmon and anywhere we introduce landlocked salmon, we almost always introduce smelts that is what took out those char, and those char were the primary forage for the giant brook trout. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is in 2005, an Arctic char was trapped in Richardson Lake, it was caught in Richardson Lake. Um, nobody knows how it got there. Is it a remnant? Did it drop down from Long Pond? If it did, it would be a huge anomaly because it traveled 15 miles and down streams. So um, catch, you know, what we should be doing in Rangeley is, is letting those, um, those uh, salmon go away. They don't belong there. And, uh, and this is a problem throughout Maine. We're doing the same thing in, in Moosehead. We've got, you know, we're protecting um, stocked non-native landlocked salmon while we declare war on wild native uh, lake trout because apparently some anglers prefer them. But, you know, the problem we have in Rangeley, which is now leading to, our, to tournaments to, uh, thin out the population. It's a self-induced problem. We caused that problem. And one of the things I say all the time is, you know, you can harvest your way into trouble, but you can't harvest your way out of it. And same with stocking. You can stock your way into trouble. You can't, you know, it's rare that you can stock your way out of it, but we need to stop moving uh, landlocked salmon. Just because they're good recreation doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. Okay, we're um, on our last question. Joshua, you're up next. Sure, yeah, I put it in the chat. Thank you for this talk. And it's so full of information that um, I'm glad it's being recorded because I'm gonna wanna go back and mine some, some of the information out that you put into this. It's a lot to take in and super impressive and compelling. So nicely done, everybody. I, I really appreciate it. I, I'm wondering, you know, this is a hard question. It's sort of uh, how do you, change people doing bad things, basically. How do you get those people that really still think that they want to put bass in their backyard pond or the place where they go to and, and um, you know, really fundamentally change the population? Or I, I shouldn't just say bass, you know, muskies, uh, walleye, all sorts of things that people move around. I'm wondering if, if you've got a strategy, um, you know, long-term, short-term to try to reach out to different fishing crowds. Uh, outside I mean, we do have a yeah we do have a strategy one one of the things we do know is you know 30 years later we're in worse trouble than we've ever been it's epidemic at this point um, and one of the the reasons is it's really hard to tell the angling community that moving bass around is a bad thing when you know ifnw is bringing um you know landlocked salmon in or rainbow trout or brown trout uh, we have people who honestly believe that, um, you know, introducing shiners is good for a population. And they say, well, you know, when we put smelt in, we got bigger fish. And again, um, you know, this is, this is bad science. So we feel like we have to go all the way back to the beginning, explain what's native, explain what's not, explain why natives are important, uh, explain why, what, why non-natives are a problem and try to create a demand for what we used to have. What we find is there are some people you'll never reach, but there are also some people that you'd be surprised at the reaction when I tell them, you know, those salmon don't belong there. And that's why your brook trout fishing is marginal. Uh, one of the things we have in Maine that's different than what we face in New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, is they've lost their wild native brook trout. They haven't seen them for a generation or more. So to them, it's foreign. All they think, it's like, they think it's so far gone, it could never be fixed. And in most cases, they're right. 
but in Maine, we still have them. And the average uh, angler in the North Country, they don't like browns. They don't want rainbows. They want uh, brook trout. So, you know, it's a matter of educating. It's a matter of informing. That's why these signs are important. It started in dialogue where people are asking questions and people are challenging the powers that be. Um, we've got a, or I made a t-shirt that's kind of funny. Um, it basically, it emulates the um, state-sponsored sign Trouble by the Bucket Full, and it's got a stocking truck on it, and it says Trouble by the Truck Full. Um, you could literally be at a boat launch in Maine looking at a sign, a state-sponsored sign that says Trouble by the, you know, Bucket Full with pictures of crappy and uh and bass and muskies while they're dumping non-stock, non-native fish in the same boat launch. So this isn't just an angler problem. This is a is a, a, a fishing game problem nationwide, where some reason you know they've decided that their their um, you know calling is to uh, address our fishing woes by introducing species by um, by stocking by uh, introducing hybrids. I mean, Maine stocks a, a lake trout, brook trout hybrid. For years, every poll they took in Maine, it was the lowest rated species as far as angler demand. And yet we kept stocking it, stocking it, stocking it until we created a demand. And so today we got people who like them, but I can show you studies where over a period of 10 years, every angler said, I don't like them, I don't even want them. You know, so this is a much deeper problem than people think. And it's as much with the powers that be as it is the Anglican community. I mean, we should be the, have to be the ones to tell people that this is a bad thing. And you, you can't tell people that something that you're doing is bad. You know, that's the, uh, you know, if there's a quick way to fail in your mission, it's the, uh, it's do what you're telling people not to do. So, you know, short answer is we have to go back to ground zero. We have to explain to people what's native and what's not, and then why it makes a difference. And, and then, you know, hope to win over as many as we can. And what we're also going to see is these state fishing game departments, they're all struggling economically. The number one expense they have are trout hatcheries. And, you know, so we're going to see some decline in that for economic reasons, if nothing else. And, uh, and we got to stay on top of them. I've got a proposal just came in the email. It's for new stocking proposals from IFNW. And for it to be a new stocking, it's something we haven't done in that body of water for 25 years. If we haven't done it for 25 years, why are we doing it now? And we will look at those. And if they make sense, we will oppose those, including going to, you know, um, you know the public hearings and stuff. But, you know, Maine stands to lose a lot if we don't get focused. And, and we need to get the non-fish conservation groups, Audubon, TNC, you know, they've all got to plug in Maine rivers on and on because uh, without their help and, and absolute cooperation, you know, we're never going to get there. And, you know, we'll end up like New Hampshire where you have miles and miles of crystal clear, beautiful water that looks healthy, but it's full of stocked fish and non-natives. Bob, <laughs> and thanks everybody for the great questions. Thanks to Friends of Mary Meeting Bay for having us. It was a lot of fun. Um, we're a great audience. And I would encourage anybody who has further questions, comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, email, Facebook, um, the website, and we'd love to continue the conversation and, and have your support if you like what you see um, as a partner or a, um, a supporting organization. So thank you so much. Appreciate it.